Good morning to you. Welcome to worship on this, the fifth Sunday of our Lenten season. Today we celebrate that the Lord gives us this great gift called salvation. And as we consider how Jesus went through so much, we are thankful that he did all things right and proper to give us that gift of salvation. That's at the heart of our worship, and we begin our worship with the singing of our first hymn. Him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. 
Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But by trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and instant death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
chapter 3, we begin reading in verse 8. As Paul reminds us, we have this great gift of salvation, but it is not something we want to take lightly. We always are to read it an attitude that we press on to receive the goal that God has chosen us to receive. What is more, I consider everything to be lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on for the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is our second lesson. Please rise for the reading of our gospel. The gospel is from Luke chapter 20, the reading reading at verse 9. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time he sent a servant to the tenants, so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of, what, of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately, because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. This is our gospel lesson. Praise
our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our gospel, or I should say our, our sermon message, are the eight verses prior to our gospel. So we are reading today from Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, We don't know where it was from. Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The Lord has a prayer. Lord, sanctify us with your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Please be seated. Our gospel lessons are already taking a peek at Holy Week. And as such, we see that there's a continual buildup of hostility towards Jesus. And we notice that Jesus isn't backing down in it. That's a great comfort for us because it gives us an idea in our own lives. This thing that we call our lives, how do we live it? And there's a real easy message for us to grasp today in the opening verses here of Luke chapter 20. Because what it invites us to do is to take Jesus at his word and make Jesus the rule for life for you and me. And the reason that's a good thing to do is because there will be many times when questions arise, either from people or from circumstances in life, that question this authority. Uh, should we really be following Jesus or the Lord God or Scripture as closely as we do? And the answer is always going to be found in the fact that, that we can see, we are able to understand the great power and wisdom of the Lord over God, and it's a kind of a no-brainer that, yes, let's live under the authority that is Christ Jesus our Lord. It makes a lot of sense when we look at what occurred here in the temple area. This is now after Jesus had taken the money changers and chased them out of the temple, saying, you've made my, the Lord's house, my father's house, a house of business. And then he comes the next day, and he proceeds to go into the courtyards around the temple area, and he is, as it says here, proclaiming the good news. He's immediately confronted by a contingency that is made up of three special groups, or the three powerful groups that are of the Jewish nation of the day. We're told that he is then confronted by the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, now the chief priests, that was their job to keep order in the temple area. The teachers of the law, they were the ones who were to make sure that everything that was being done was properly reflecting what God said in Scripture. And then the elders, these are the ones that were elected by the people to the Sanhedrin, or Sanhedrin, how we pronounce it, which is the ruling assembly for the Jewish people. And that eventually is the group that would condemn Jesus to death. So these three groups rightfully had the authority to come to Jesus and ask him, by what power are you doing this? But as we see in Jesus' response, they didn't come with the idea of trying to make sure everything's done correctly. They were totally against what Jesus was doing. And we'll find that in our lives, too, when people innocently ask us, or it seems innocently, why it is we do what we do, or why do we believe what we believe, their intent may not be just to, oh, I'd like to do some fact-finding. So often it is an intent that says, I'd like you to realize how absurd you are, 
how you have no basis for even presenting a viewpoint, and really, you should abandon it. That's the nature of why these people came to Jesus. In the early years of his ministry, Jesus took pains to continually, but firmly, confront them. Now, he's not going to play games with them. Because we do see that's what people like to do when it comes down to God's word and where it should be, what, what priority should it be in people's lives. Jesus confronts them. Instead of answering their question, he reveals that he knows what's in their hearts by asking them about John the Baptist. What do you say about John the Baptist? Did he have divine authority or was he just acting as a human? And then they decided we better talk about this a little bit among ourselves. It's good. It's good to always sit back and, and re-examine what God challenges us to think about and to think about the answer we would give. But here, look at the way they were reasoning. Well, if we say he is his authority was from heaven, then he's going to challenge us and say, well, then why didn't we believe? When John was preaching, what was he saying? He was asking them to repent of their sins. He was openly challenging people to abandon their sinful ways, their selfish ways, and to consider God's ways as the most important ways in life. But the Pharisees, the, the elders, and the teachers of the law, they didn't want to give credence or believability to John the Baptist. Because to do so would then say, you know what? As much as we like to see ourselves elevated above everybody else, even to the point of saying we deserve eternal life, we got to admit we're sinners. We're not going to do that. We're going to hold our own lives as of greater importance, and even to the point of being perfected, so that no one can call us into question. So now they have a dilemma, though, because if they would then say John the Baptist was just an ordinary man, he was just out there doing his own weird religious thing out there in the desert, then people would rise up against them and would stone them, put them to death, because they were convinced John was a prophet. And indeed he was. As Malachi said, the last prophecy in the Old Testament, he was the forerunner of the way for the Messiah. And the people had, just a couple days prior to this, had said about Jesus, Hosanna to the son of David. We'll think of that more next week when we get to Palm Sunday. But you see, the people caused them to stop and think about it. That's a beautiful thing, too. Sometimes you wonder, well, what, what can we do as an individual when it seems like there's a world out there that's bent on following the paths of sin? Don't for a minute forget that there are many, many people who continually worship the Lord God. And that, that specter, that idea that there are people out there who would worship the Lord God, thankfully, especially in those who like to pretend they're following God, it carries a little bit of water. But these people were not going to then acknowledge that Jesus was from God, or that his message was even remotely related to God. So they simply come up with that convenient, that what they think is a middle road. Uh, we don't know where it was from, namely his authority. God's authority. Well, people do that today. It's really easy for us then to, to kind of pretend like maybe God is a little bit foggy on things. You know, when he says something, well, maybe that was said so many years ago. We don't live in tents anymore. We don't raise camels. We don't uh, have herds of sheep. We then want to say, well, maybe we really can't make those statements as firm as they were once. And that would be such a travesty. That's just a sin to simply say, God didn't know what he was talking about in years past, or, or it was only relevant to those people. Some people today like to say, we've evolved, we've, we've come further down the road, we're smarter, we're more intelligent, and therefore we don't have to worry about the things that those people did. And when you challenge people, isn't this what God said about what's, what is marriage, or what about morality? What about selfishness? What about serving the Lord God? A universal, part of the universal priesthood. Worshiping together. Uh, remembering the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
people don't want to hear the answers. But we do. Because we recognize that. Jesus said here, he was not going to them because they were going to acknowledge John's authorities from heaven and he wasn't going to answer their question. He said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Actually, Jesus did. Actually, Jesus was there in the temple proclaiming the good news and pointing out where sins are forgiven. He openly associated with the tax collectors, with that general group of people called sinners, and pronounced to them that their sins are forgiven. That contrary to what the Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law said, you can have your sins forgiven. There is hope, and he, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, as he called himself, and that people were convinced also to call him the Son of God, because he did those miracles, and he spoke the word of truth. Even when they arrested him, remember what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, I've been here every day at your doorstep in these courtyards. Didn't arrest me. Why do you come at night like thieves with torches and swords to take me captive? When he could have simply asked me, at that point, come follow me. Isn't it sad how some people have to decide we're going to do all things, even though we know it's right, in a devious manner? Well, not for us. We get the chance to say, Lord, strengthen that faith, that conviction inside of us to make sure that we gladly ask you, Lord, to rule our lives. And we need to keep on encouraging each other that that is exactly what we do. All of us have been confirmed. I mean, we've taken a vow. We've said we'd rather die than allow us to do like Peter, deny the Lord, not follow what the Lord says. That's a quite a blessing when we allow each other to call each other out on what we're doing. Are we letting the Lord rule in our lives? Is Jesus really the source of authority for us? And of course, the answer is, he better be, because there's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. So to, to put yourself under the Lord God is to open yourself up to eternal life in heaven. And when you put it that way, then you find you're making a lot of statements in life, like Joseph before Potiphar's wife. How can I do this wicked thing? We sin against God, and we get a chance to encourage each other. Then let's act like it. Let's let this Lord so rule and be the authority of our lives that we wouldn't do something that would be terribly tragic. Remember what the people said in the, the gospel lesson that we have today, right after this, when Jesus told them this parable about the tenants and the killing of the servant, or the son of the owner of that vineyard, they said, oh, may it never be. May, may God never put to death those who have been so cruel to me. May they never turn that vicious against the Lord, the owner of that vineyard. And Jesus was saying that that is exactly what they were doing. And yes, those people wanted to put him to death. But even then, the most wicked act that they could think about and carry out against Jesus could only serve the will of God. And that's also what we keep in mind. It's like Paul says in Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate us from the love in Christ Jesus that is ours through him. And so we rejoice. And if somebody wants to stop having the Lord be their authority, sadly, all we can do is say, please don't. You're turning your back on salvation. But when we repent of our sins, when we turn back to the Lord God, He is most gracious and merciful and faithful to take us back. So what a wonderful opportunity to think of what was once done to Jesus and to say, not here. That part of our Easter worship is to remind ourselves always, let's live under this Lord God, for great is His mercy, and great is the care we receive each day until we are with Him in heaven. And right you now to please stand. And even from memory, or turn to page 41, let us confess our faith, this wonderful mercy and grace we have in Christ. We'll be using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The offering will be gathered for the name. And lead us 
us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, for peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Now, yes, you can say along the way enough 
that uh, Northwestern Publishing House is going to be printing that translation, which is being worked on by pastors in our synod as well as in the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, our sister synod. And this just gives you some information about that. Also, if you look at the Forward in Christ for this month, you will see an article about this too. But what this tells us is that in the future we will have a copy or a translation from the Greek and the Hebrew that will have been done or worked on by people of our synod, and it probably will be the type of Bible that we will use in our pews or in our literature, in our worship. So looking forward to that. They do have a passion history that is all ready to view. You can go online and look at that, and we'll be using some of those lessons during Holy Week for Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. So uh, you might want to take a look at that if that interests you. Uh, that means that in the future, and this will probably be a couple of years, uh, we would be able to purchase that sort of Bible and use it for our own studies. Also, I'd like to remind you that we do have a sign-up slip in the uh, extended narthex for the Easter breakfast, and also there you can sign up for the Easter flowers. You can have, uh, invite you to read the many other announcements that are included in our bulletin, and before you are ushered off, I'd encourage you to greet one another this morning. <laughs> 